Jewish Community Relations Commission, the General Union in Palestine Students, and the Committee on Lectures funded by GSB. I want to welcome you to this evening's dialogue on the Arab-Israeli conflict. My name is Wayne Osborne. I teach Latin American history at Iowa State University and a course called Historical Perspectives on Peace and War. This evening we have a panel of four individuals, each of whom will present a opening statement of some 10 minutes duration. After that period, there will be a chance for the panel to react to one another uh, in a very short period of time. And then we will open it up to the audience for participation. And by participation, we will accept some general statements, but we would prefer that your statements ultimately culminate in a question uh, directed toward one of the panelists or panelists collectively. I will introduce uh, each of the panelists briefly in the order that they are going to speak. I will do a collective introduction now and a very brief one so we can have time for the actual panel. Coming to us from Chicago is the Honorable Hayam Karan, who is the Israeli Consul from the Israeli Consulate General in Chicago, third from the Pope. Representing a uh, Palestinian point of view and experience is uh, Wasif Mar uh, Masri, who is a PhD candidate at Iowa State University in electrical <laughs> engineering. Our fourth speaker is Ted Latin, who is the Jewish Community Relations Commission Executive Director from Des Moines, Iowa. Professor Adrian Wing, a law professor at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, and she will be speaking. At this point, we will call upon Mr. Hyam Karan. Thank you, and good evening. I hope uh, everybody can hear me. When I asked the uh, distinguished professor how long should we speak, he told me that I can speak as long as I want. In 10 minutes, everybody's here. So uh, we'll try to do it uh, short to the point, and we'll leave you enough room for Q&A later on. Uh, so we start simply uh, to the point. As you all probably are well aware, uh, we changed some phase in the Middle East since the uh, September the 13th. Then we have the Israeli government uh, dialogue, and it contains the philosophy of potential comprehensive peace in the Middle East. That is to say, up to then, we had Madrid, um, Madrid track that we had bilateral talks with each of the Arab states and the Palestinians, namely Lebanon, Syria, Jordan and the Palestinians. At the same token, we have multilateral talks about five main issues like water, refugees, environment, etc. Now, the name of the game was trying to change uh, the situation of the conflict from zero sum game. That means if I win, you lose, and uh, vice versa, to uh, the possibilities that everybody will win means to create some uh, situation that we can uh, proceed uh, in all tracks at the same time that anybody can benefit from. So uh, that's why, in addition to the agreement with the PLO, we decided to volunteer and make any effort to recruit money for the Palestinians, with the Palestinians, in order to uh, create joint, joint ventures, good infrastructure for their future, for our future, 
and for the, for the other Arab state in the area uh, that we can go on. That's the basic logic behind this uh, point of view. Now, I don't say that everything is wonderful right now at that moment on because uh, the difficulties are down the road. There's no question about that. Uh, the document between that written between the DLO and us is kind of uh, constructive ambiguity, as Henry Kissinger probably uh, will point out, in order to enable the two sides to start negotiating with different interpretation that possible in order to get to some kind of an agreement later on. Now, the basic differences are that we believe, that we, the Israeli government, believe in trial and error uh, process. Namely, if we're talking about self-rule, starting with Gaza and Jericho, uh, which derived, of course, from Camp David Accords, and not from uh, UN Resolution 242 and 338, like we have with the other armed country, that is, that is to say, that we have to uh, concentrate on implementing the arrangement for the next two years by trial and error and then starting to deal about the final status after five years. And that, of course, can't emerge just like that from the areas. We have to work on that together. First of all, with Palestinians, by day-to-day uh, -day, uh, cooperation, relationship, and uh, what we call confidential uh, building measures, CBMs, in order to show a good atmosphere uh, for the future. For example, we released recently a uh, few hundreds of uh, Palestinian prisoners from jail, according to certain kind of uh, regulation. We are trying to, uh, we sitting down in Taba now for dealing about uh, how we start this agreement with the Egyptian, with the uh, in Egyptian Daba, with the Palestinian, namely how we deal with Jericho. Is Jericho, is Jericho itself a town or the Jericho district? That's for itself a good question. Who's going to control it? Our forces or Palestinian forces? Or maybe together? What will happen when the IDF withdraw from Jericho and Gaza? Who's going to take care about the security there and about the settlement? Security too, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, we claim that we already made some concession and going away ahead with a posi positive uh, thinking, namely to release prisoners, to recruit money for the Palestinians, uh, to enable implementing self rule there. And we would like to hear more strongly renunciation of terrorism, for example, or uh, we understand difficulties in the Palestinian side. According to the agreement, uh, uh, we thought about uh, changing articles in the Palestinian government that calling for destruction of the state of Israel. So we understand that the PNC should reaffirm that in a majority of two thirds, and it's not easy because of the Palestinian forces that oppose the peace talk. So we said we decided to start even before there. But we accepted, expected that after some terrorist attacks that happened last week with a uh, bomb explosion um, and uh, some killing of uh, uh, hijackers and things like that, at least we will some uh, condemn from the Palestinian side, and it didn't come. On the other hand, we don't want to push too much in order not to uh, create an atmosphere that we're demanding and pushing rather than waiting that seems to emerge naturally. Uh, another very interesting point and important is uh, the Arab boycott. You know, from the very beginning of uh, establishing the state of Israel, uh, there's uh, an Arab boycott that uh, it cost up till now uh, to us around losses of around uh, 50 billion dollars. Uh, and if we're talking about creating common market in the Middle East, infrastructure, joint ventures, that we need money and investment in the Middle East, there's no reason to come and to keep on with the Arab world. There's no logic behind it. Uh, we uh, would like to see uh, the moderate stream among the Palestinian community 
overcome the extremists. Most of them are uh, Muslim radicals who oppose the peace talk from any various reasons. First, it's a religious reason that uh, they don't have the, uh, let's say, uh, they, they, uh, Palestine, according to their point of view, it's a dominant that they're holding for God, for the Muslims, for Palestine and the Muslim land. So, uh, as such, they cannot negotiate with non Muslim infidels because, according to their point of view, the land belongs to them. Now, if that's the case, we have a real problem because uh, we cannot deal with that. So, if those people who signed the agreement, and we all, all hope that they respect the signature, uh, mean seriously, they have to deal with those forces too. And I'm not uh, talking now about other refusal or rejections in the Palestinian wings in the base of Damascus, those 10 organizations that uh, are actively trying to uh, jeopardize uh, the peace treaty. Now, I know that my Palestinian colleague will talk about his point of view, but we have some more things because we are standing vis-a-vis uh, in front of or against at least four groups, which means Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Palestine, and they have only us. Now, uh, I have to refer to the others too, because the interrelationship between the Palestinian and the other group are very significant. For example, the Syrians are very angry about the agreement. Why the Palestinian jumped ahead and didn't wait for the Syria? Now, they want to get some achievement according to their point of view, means full peace that didn't define the act for full to destroy, which is a different story. Now, the Jordanians are also part of uh, the treaty because we're living together whether we like it or not. And we can speak about federation, confederation, Israel, Palestinian, and Jordan in order to create this mechanism uh, for a new Middle East. So, very shortly, uh, you can see clearly that our point of view totally got to the positive one uh, uh, with a little bit of vision that maybe cynical uh, person will say that we are a little bit naive and that is to say to start change from reality uh, after the uh, new world order and especially after the Gulf War and trying to work with cooperation with the neighbors but for Tango, we need at least two, in our case some more, and it's not enough that only one part gives its goodwill. We are expecting some uh, cooperation for the other side too. Up till now, it sounds very promising. Uh, we had a uh, few meetings in Daba to be ready for the December the 13th. We had a few multilateral talks about water in Beijing, and today, Oman, uh, uh, requesting to host the next meeting there, which is very good. Uh, Tunis hosted the refugees uh, uh, working group in, in Tunis for the first time to us to be in the Arab hosting country, which is very significant to us, even though it's not formal. But uh, we and we urge the Europeans, the Americans, the Japanese, and the entire communities in the world to contribute, including ourselves. We, we contribute $75 million in the next five years for the Palestinians in order to build their own infrastructure and uh, uh, opening some opportunities, joint ventures, Israelis and Palestinians that have already been started, and uh, trying to attract, especially the Syrians, into this atmosphere in order to enable a uh, quick move to, uh, uh, to a better, uh, uh, negotiation. Now, a word about difficulty. Uh, we have, uh, you all probably know the, uh, the famous saying in Arabic, you're probably aware of that. So don't expect, I'm sorry, that uh, it will take time. We need patience. And uh, it won't happen in one day. But we all need to be aware of that. The, American mind expecting to cut the deal and tomorrow start implementing it. 
it's not working that way in the Middle East. I can assure you that the politics in the Middle East is a little bit different from those of the Midwest. So we need to have some uh, patience. But uh, if we overcome uh, very serious issues like uh, what we're going to do with settlements, what we're going to do uh, with other issues, side by side and slowly, slowly, with good will, we can do that. Uh, it's clear that our goal in this agreement is to get a, a full peace with the neighbors, to have the Palestinian uh, self-rule in the territory, which decided where and when, and the Palestinian probably would like to have a Palestinian state. That's why I mentioned before that uh, constructing ambiguity of the document. Now, in this document, no mentioning of Palestinian state, no mentioning of settlements, and no mentioning of Jerusalem. So it leaves the uh, space open for fruitful negotiation. And if uh, from December we start working on uh, keeping peace in Jericho and Gaza area, and come on uh, uh, mutual control of Israelis and Palestinians in order to keep order, joint venture in Jericho, and later on on Mawa, Nablus, and other places. It's a very good start uh, uh, for, uh, and potential for a better future. Uh, by intention, I try to avoid the uh, memories that we have from the past, and we all have, and it's very easy to go back and dig inside, and I didn't want to do it, and uh, uh, it's not written here a debate, but but rather a dialogue. So I came with a more positive issue. I'm ready, of course, to debate with anybody of you, but I start to show some new vision and new hope uh, to get out from the old uh, attitudes, and hopefully it will be respected by the other school. Uh, if, uh, one more point about uh, Muslim radicalism. Uh, it should be mentioned that it's not a typical phenomenon only for the territory. It's not only in Gaza and the West Bank. You can find it all over. You can find it in uh, from Iran through Sudan, Egypt, all the way to uh, Algeria and uh, North Africa. So it's not uh, a specific issue uh, for uh, our region. But we believe that with uh, intelligent investment and with uh, preventing social uh, circumstances that cause people to come desperately to Islam, not because of they understand the spirit of Islam, but because they push to, in a, in, to the very military wing of the Islam, uh, we can uh, prevent that and attract them to the positive side, to be the moderate side of the Palestinians and to cooperate with them. Uh, if you think that I have an answer right now, if everything will be succeed, you're wrong. And me too. I don't have one. But I have a hope. So uh, let's start, let's open, and hopefully we will get something. Thank you. because sometimes it's important to understand what happened in the past to understand what, what's happening in the present. 
felt strange to me to hear him uh, talk about Palestinians, and the Palestinian delegation, the Palestinian state, mention these words. Because in the Sunday Times of in the Sunday Times in 1969, Mrs. Golda Meir, then Israeli Prime Minister, declared, quote, there was no such thing as Palestinians. It was not as though there was a Palestinian people. And we came and threw them out and took their country from them. They did not exist. This uh, approach to the conflict in the Middle East has been typical of the Israeli government since the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, up till recently, all Israeli government denied the existence of Palestinians. Prime Minister Begin went as far as calling, uh, portraying Palestinians as cockroaches. And Prime Minister Shamir portrayed them as grasshoppers. So the approach of Israel to the conflict in the Middle East has always been to deny the existence of a Palestinian problem and that the problem is with Arab countries, neighboring Arab, Arab countries, and that any solution has to be in signing peace treaty with neighboring Arab countries. And they always refer to Palestinians as Arab inhabitants or uh, Arab population in the occupied territories. So until recently, until the Intifada started, Israel did not even acknowledge the Palestinians as a people. Now that changed in the Intifada, and eventually it led to the agreement signed between the PLO and the Israeli government. A lot of Palestinians see the agreement as a step in the right direction towards a comprehensive settlement in the Middle East. But many people are still, are still skeptic that this agreement does not address the main issue that concerns Palestinians. Before I explain why, I'd like to establish that in order to have a peace process or a dialogue between uh, two parties in a conflict, it's important that each side of the conflict understand the concerns of the other side rather than each side going with their own agenda and just trying to negotiate getting as much as they can of concessions. I think it's important to understand the other side's concerns and demands. So in this case, as much as it is important, I think, for Palestinians to understand that it's a major concern for the Israelis or one of the major concerns for Israelis is the issue of the security of the State of Israel. I think it's as well important for Israelis to understand that a major issue for Palestinians is acknowledging the issue of acknowledging the Palestinians as a people with national aspirations. Now the history of the conflict has shown otherwise. It has shown that Israel has always failed to address Palestinian identity. <coughs> and that has developed feelings of mistrust on, in Palestinians, in the heart of Palestinians and in the minds of Palestinians. In the 1948 war, for example, before, during, and after the war, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were misplaced. They were either fled their homes or either were expelled from their homes. After the war, these refugees were denied the return to their homes, despite several UN resolutions demanding Israel to allow them the right to return. <coughs> Moreover, out of 475, 475 towns and villages, Palestinian towns and villages, only 50, I'm sorry, only 90 remain today. The other 385 were demolished, raised to the ground. 
by Israeli settlers. This kind of act is interpreted by Palestinians as a threat to their existence and that the Israelis are trying to uproot them from their land. A similar thing happened, happened in the 1967 war, when as a result of the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, more Palestinians were displaced and expelled from their homes. And this kind of feeling is not only the result of war, it's also based on daily practices by the Israeli authorities. For example, one of the forms of punishment for Palestinians who resist the occupation is deportation. And this is seen also by, this, this generates a feeling in the Palestinians, a strong sentiment that Israel is trying to detach them from their land and denying them their existence that's related to their land. Another form of punishment Another form of collective punishment is demolishing of houses. The houses that these people grew, uh, grew up in. And a form of punishment, punishment that's especially painful to Palestinians is the uprooting or cutting of trees, especially olive trees. These olive trees are, have very strong, significant uh, meaning to Palestinians, Christians and Muslim Palestinians, because they have a biblical, biblical significance. They are a symbol of peace. And above all, it's uh, uh, olive trees, many olive trees live more than 100 years, so they're passed from generation to generation. And for Palestinians, they're a symbol of heritage, that they're a symbol of their attachment to their land. Now, skeptics say that the agreement stops short of addressing this important point or this important issue, the issue of Palestinian identity. Despite the fact that in the agreement, Palestinians recognize Israel and recognize their right to exist. It took 45 years for Israel to recognize Palestinians as a people and to negotiate with them. And the question is now, how long will it take before they recognize the Palestinian people of self, to recognize the right of the Palestinian people for self-determination and acknowledge their national aspirations? Thank you. self-determination in the Middle East with rejection, military aggression, and terror. During this sad segment of history, quite literally not a single Israeli family was spared the searing pain of bereavement when a family member or friend fell in war or terrorist action. The overwhelming majority of the Israeli population desires peace with a passion that can only develop in a nation that has known nothing but death, blood, and conflict. Israeli parents eagerly await the day when the traditional rite of passage for their children will not be the commencement of military service at age 18, but going off to college or beginning a career. Just a few weeks ago on the south lawn of the White House, we saw what most would have believed to be impossible just a short time before. A handshake between Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin. A gesture that all people of goodwill must hope will signify the dawning of a new era in the Middle East. An era of cooperation rather than conflict, of harmony rather than hostility. Personally, I have a special interest in that part of the world. Born in the United States, I was brought up in Israel after my family moved there when I was a child. In both of my incarnations, as an American Jew and as an Israeli, I support the Israeli people. <coughs> I eagerly anticipate a time when both Israel and her Arab neighbors will be able to devote their energy and resources to education, 
economic development, and improving the quality of life for Arab and Jew alike. But while we hope that the accord between Israel and her Arab neighbors will usher in an era of peaceful coexistence, we must not allow ourselves to be swept away by unreasoning optimism. The Israeli PLO Declaration of Principles represents just the first step in what will undoubtedly prove to be a long and difficult road toward reconciliation. The final stage negotiations that are scheduled to begin two years from now will deal with some of the thorniest issues that separate Palestinians and Israelis. These include who, get, who, who gets exactly what territory, what form the final borders will take, and the most passionately, passionately disputed question of all, the status of Jerusalem. Despite the progress made towards peace, we must temper our hopes and dreams with a certain awareness of certain undeniable facts that are sources of extreme concern. We see a, lack, a complete lack of democratic political institutions in any of the 20 nations that make up the Arab world. We see Arab countries governed by absolute monarchies, where dictatorships, where transfers of power are normally carried out not by democratic election, but as the result of armed revolution, assassination, or coup d'etat. We see that the Arab Middle East is ruled by cruel tyrants who oppress their own people with methods far more brutal than any measures ever used by Israel. Rulers such as Hafez al-Assad of Syria, who massacred 25,000 of his own citizens while putting down an Islamic fundamentalist rebellion in 1982. Or Saddam Hussein, whose sordid record includes two unprovoked invasions of neighboring countries and the use of poison gas and firing squads to murder some 250,000 Kurds in northern Iraq. Throughout the Middle East, we see a rising tide of Muslim radicalism, a movement of religious zealots who wish to impose their interpretation of Islam on others through violence and terror, a movement that believes that Israel has no right to exist and that Jews throughout the world should be murdered. In short, we realize that despite the recent peace accord, the Middle East is still an unstable place. It remains a very dangerous neighborhood in which to live. Now, how do these realities influence Israel's position on the peace process? Well, that is simple. Even after a peace agreement is signed and sealed, Israel must still retain the means to defend herself. What if, for example, the ruler with whom peace was negotiated is overthrown and, rep and replaced by a radical anti-Israel ruler? With these facts in mind, let us focus our attention on one of the most important and yet most often overlooked factors that influence Israel's position on the final form any peace agreement must take. The importance of Judea Samaria, or the West Bank if you prefer, to Israel's ability to defend herself in future attack will doubtless prove to be one of the most difficult issues under discussion. Let us first look at the potential threat with which Israel might have to contend in the future. Throughout her 45-year-old history, the most dangerous threat to Israel's survival has been a coordinated attack by a coalition of neighboring Arab states. During the 1948 Israeli War of Independence, and again in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Israel was simultaneously assaulted by a number of Arab armies. In both cases, the Jewish state was brought to the verge of disastrous defeat. The worst case scenario currently envisaged by the Israeli general staff is to create the creation of a so-called Eastern Front coalition of Syria, Jordan, and a revitalized Iraq. For Iraq to rebuild its military, all it would need is a source of money and someone willing to sell it arms. In this era of global military downsizing, it is clear that there are many arms producers throughout the world who are desperate to sell literally anything to anybody. Furthermore, Iraq's tremendous oil reserves give it potential for huge amounts of future revenue. And who knows how long the will of the international community will remain steadfast on the issue of sanctions for Iraq. It is entirely possible that five, 10, or 15 years down the road, Saddam Hussein and his successor will have rebuilt the Iraqi army into a large military machine that could again threaten Israel. If the Eastern Front scenario envisaged by IDF planners ever came to pass, Israel would be subjected to a coordinated Arab attack 
over a front some 200 miles in length, from the Golan Heights in the north, you can probably see it on the map there, to the Dead Sea. The combined military assets of the Syrian, Jordanian, Iraqi coalition could reach a total of 21 divisions, which is 250,000 men and 4,500 tanks. Moreover, the Arab nations possess standing armies that would allow them to launch an overwhelmingly powerful attack with only minimal time to prepare. Now, let us look at the impact of territory and terrain on Israel's ability to repel such an attack. The terrain factors may be doubly important by the fact that Israel's small population makes it unable to maintain a large standing army like those of its Arab neighbors. At normal stages of readiness, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, has only some 15% of its combat strength immediately available at any given time. The remaining 85% of the IDF order of battle is made up of reserve units that need at least 48 hours to mobilize and reach the front. Because Israel is such a small country where everyone serves in the military, a general mobilization causes the Israeli economy to shut down. Therefore, Israel cannot afford to mobilize its army at, ever, at every hint of danger and is thus vulnerable to surprise attack. And this is what exactly happened in the 1973 Yom Kippur War when Israel was caught by surprise. Now, you must bear in mind that we are really talking about a very small piece of territory. Today, even when the occupied territories of Judea and Samaria are included, Israel is only 42 miles wide from the current border on the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Thus, the width of the entire Jewish state with the occupied territories is about the same as the distance between Des Moines and Newton, Iowa. Before the 1967 Six-Day War, Israel's Green Line border with Jordan came to within a distance of nine miles from the Mediterranean Sea. And you can see that on the map, the Green Line and the narrow waistline. One does not have to be a military expert to realize that Israel's pre-67 borders were inherently indefensible in the event of serious attack. In such circumstances, a determined enemy could cut Israel in half by means of a short 20-minute tank drive. That is why Abba Evan, Israel's further, former foreign minister, minister, termed them, quote, Auschwitz borders, end of quote. Beyond the simple element of size, a topographical map, which we also have over there, clearly reveals an additional factor that affords the Judean and Sumerian area an extraordinary importance to Israel's strategic posture. The Judean Sumerian mountain range runs the entire length of this area, north to south. To the west, the Judean and Sumerian mountains overlook Israel's heartland, the narrow Mediterranean coastal plain between Haifa and Ashdod, where three out of every four Israelis live and where 80% of Israel's economic activity is located. To the east, these mountains dominate the Jordan River Valley, which at an elevation of 1,200 feet below sea level is the lowest point of land on Earth. The absolute topographical dominance of the Judean and Sumerian mountains over the Jordan River Valley to the east and the Mediterranean coastal plain to the west makes the possession of this mountain range very important in Israel's strategic thinking. The mountain peaks provide the Israeli army with a superb series of observation posts which supply intelligence and warn of potential surprise attack to the east. And also the chain of mountains provides Israel with its only militarily viable defense line within the narrow 40 mile stretch of territory that separates the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. On a 3,000 mile wide continent flanked by broad oceans on either side, the United States can afford to make strategic blunders without jeopardizing its very existence. America can survive the military disaster of Pearl Harbor and yet go on to prevail in the Second World War. The U.S. can weather the long agony of defeat in Vietnam and yet live on. But alas, not all nations are so strategically blessed. The geographic, political, and strategic realities of Israel's situation in the Middle East make the Jewish state much more vulnerable to military misfortune. For Israel, her first defeat would represent her last battle. We should remember that the 1967 Six-Day War was a war of self-preservation fought by Israel in the face of Arab belligerence and threats to wipe out the Jewish state. 
Despite the defensive nature of the conflict in which the occupied territories came under Israeli control, Israel declared a willingness to return land to the Arabs shortly after the end of the fighting. Foreign Minister Yigal Alon proposed a plan in which Israel would retain the strategic Jordan River Valley and the eastern slopes of the Judean Samarian Mountains, while returning Sinai, Gaza, and the rest of the West Bank to Arab sovereignty. All the Arabs had to do was accept the idea of territorial compromise, recognize Israel's right to exist, and sign a peace treaty with Israel. Instead, the Arab League rejected the Alone Plan, adopting instead the three no's policy. No negotiations with Israel, no recognition with Israel, no peace with Israel. The negotiations for a final settlement are certainly to be lengthy and difficult. For all the reasons we have just discussed, Israel is going to adopt a very tough negotiating position on those issues that she deems vital to her security. Having been forced to fight five wars and endure countless acts of terrorism, all within a short 45-year existence, has made the Israelis extremely cautious where military matters are concerned. But this Israeli caution should not be interpreted as a lack of desire for peace. Israel is willing to return those territories which are not vital to her ability to defend herself in the future. This is what Yitzhak Rabin means when he speaks of, quote, territorial compromise, end of quote. Now, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, a compromise is defined as, quote, a coming to terms or arrangement of a dispute by concessions on both sides. In order to reach the oasis of peace from the bloody badlands of war and conflict, both parties will have to make concessions. By accepting the principle of territorial compromise, by recognizing the PLO, by expressing its willingness to return Gaza and Jericho, Israel has proven that she is willing and ready to be flexible for peace. We hope that the Arabs as well will be willing to adopt a similar flexibility. We are cautiously optimistic that, some, that the Palestinians and some of the other Arab nations have truly abandoned their prior denial of Israel's right to exist within secure borders. We would like to see the Arab boycott of Israel lifted immediately as a confidence building measure and a gesture of goodwill. We hope that the Palestinians, Jordanians, and Syrians will now be willing to accept the principle of territorial compromise. We hope that the Arabs will not try to mask their rejectionism <coughs> as they did in the past by demanding preconditions for peace that they know full well Israel cannot meet. We hope they will come forward in the true spirit of conciliation and compromise that recognizes Israel's legitimate security concerns. The historic agreement between Israel and the PLO that we all witnessed a few short weeks ago creates the hope that now we are entering a new era, an era of peaceful coexistence between nations in the Middle East that will truly cause the desert to bloom. As a member of the Jewish people, I hope for a day when Israel will be better known for its microprocessors rather than its military prowess, for its technological sophistication rather than its tactical skills. As an Israeli, I await the time when I will no longer have to visit the homes of newly fallen comrades in arms to comfort, comfort their parents, wives, and children during a time of mourning. As a member of the human race, I anticipate an era when the only things dropping in the Middle East will be not artillery shells, but illiteracy and child mortality rates. For a time when the, word, when the word smart will be used to describe Arab and Jewish children, not laser-guided bombs. Since the beginning of the Arab conflict, Arab-Israeli conflict, there has been more than enough bloodshed and suffering to fill a thousand history books. It's time to look beyond the future, beyond the past to the future. But while we focus on our vision, for the years to come, we must realize that Israel's security needs are really quite reasonable and easy to understand. Like any other nation, Israel deserves borders in which she can not only survive, but where she can thrive. And the world should not laugh, ask Israel to accept anything less. Thank you very much.